doubt lingers when resorting to desperate measures. What actions could have steered clear of this situation? What steps might have prevented my current predicament? I was fairly certain my choices were limited. How do you make an adult realize their actions risk destroying everything they cherish? You can't coerce them into anything. You can only helplessly witness and handle the aftermath. That's where I found myself. My affectionate wife believed this would strengthen us, showcasing our love's depth and significance. I perceived it as a testament to her weak affection, highlighting her selfishness and indulgence. I'm just an average man leading an ordinary life. I'm not a resilient, tender, romantic hero. Like anyone else, I have flaws. I often focus too much on myself, work excessively, and occasionally express unwarranted anger. It's not intentional, it just happens. I'm only human. Such is life, work and events often disrupt the flow. Amanda and I have been married for 19 years, enjoying closeness moments two or three times a week. It was always pleasurable, and we shared the enthusiasm for more when time allowed. Hobbies like football, good books, or TV shows, along with parental responsibilities, sometimes diverted our attention. Yet, we made time when necessary, or when desire struck. Our marriage sailed smoothly, our finances improved, and our daughters Olivia and Audra, age 16 and 14, added joy to our lives. While I may have considered myself ordinary, they were something extraordinary. Life was flourishing until my wife entertained unconventional ideas. She labeled our bed life as plain vanilla and insisted on spicing things up. Despite my satisfaction, I agreed to play along. Initially, it involved experimenting with different positions, which I found enjoyable due to my athleticism and good shape. However, the novelty wore off after a few times. Then came the phase of role-playing, a concept I couldn't fathom its origin. Girlfriends, women's magazines, or some misguided TV show, perhaps. It was fun for about three times, but eventually, it seemed impractical. Concentrating on a hot woman while trying to maintain a Leonardo DiCaprio character, or remember she was Scarlett Johansson, became challenging. I refused to continue and suddenly, she expressed displeasure. She inquired about the last time I went on a date. I replied that just the past Friday, I took her to that Italian place she wanted to try. We went to the movies, and her mom looked after the girls overnight, as she reminded me. Clarifying that she didn't mean with her, she asked how long it had been since I went out with someone else. I questioned if she was accusing me of something. She quickly assured me that she wasn't, and wondered if I remembered the name of the last girl I went out with besides her. Confirming that I did, I mentioned her name was Donna, about two weeks after I met her. We had a big argument about that date. When she asked if I ever missed it, I laughed and said, God, no. I recalled how awful the whole dating thing was, not the date itself, which was pretty good. Working up the nerve to ask a girl out, worrying about being shot down, awkward first conversations, it was traumatic as hell, more like absolutely terrifying. She then asked what brought this on. I explained that I was just wondering if she ever felt like she'd like to go out on a date with someone else. She assured me that she had never felt like that. She recalled being extremely upset when I went out with Donna, reminding me that she told me she wanted us to be exclusive. I agreed, mentioning that I wanted the same. I added that if I felt differently, I wouldn't have asked her to marry me. Being married, I explained, means you don't go on dates with people other than your spouse. She dropped the subject and I didn't hear any more about it for a month. It was a Friday night, and we had just finished making love, without any role-playing or gimmicks. It was just us, a man and his wife, enjoying each other. I came twice, and she must have climaxed half a dozen times. We lay there in post-pleasure bliss. Then she brought up something that disrupted the mood. Amanda mentioned how Sebra was looking at me tonight and suggested that she wanted me to ask her to dance. Sebra is a friend from Amanda's workplace. I assured Amanda that it was flattering but emphasized that I only wanted to dance with her. She shared that she told Sebra that she wouldn't be jealous if I asked her. In response, I said that it was nice of her but made it clear that I had no intention of asking Sebra to dance. Amanda then asked if she would be jealous if I danced with another man. I attempted to lighten the mood by joking that her brother would be okay, but she didn't find it amusing. She clarified that she had never cared if I danced with guys who asked nicely and kept their hands where they belong. She inquired if there was someone at the event I wanted to dance with. I replied that I didn't remember anyone asking me, 
and she accepted my response, stating that she was just wondering. I had no clue where this was headed, but I wasn't comfortable with it. Doubting my ability to sleep, I got up and went to the den, engrossed in a video game. She appeared at the door, observing me for a moment, but I didn't meet her gaze. She returned to bed, and I joined her once she was asleep. Everything remained quiet for two months, until Angela's promotion party at the White Rhino with a great band. We all sat in a big circular booth, and Amanda was talking to Zebra Corwin. Amanda mentioned that Zebra wanted to dance and asked if I could be a gentleman and dance with her. Recalling a conversation from two months ago, I found myself in an awkward position. While valuing Zebra's friendship and not wanting to hurt her feelings, I wasn't keen on dancing with her. The prospect of her lush body against mine raised concerns, but I wasn't sure how to gracefully decline. Although I enjoyed dancing, I wasn't confident in my abilities, especially compared to Zebra, who moved gracefully like a big cat. Feeling there was no good way out, I stood up and mentioned that I thought they were playing our song. Zebra joined me, her brown thighs visible below the short blue dress. As the song ended, the band started a slow number, and I wondered why now. Zebra fit against me seamlessly, and I could feel her bust against my chest, with her black curls nearly covering my face. She smelled nice, and when she looked up at me, her big brown eyes were like liquid pools, and her teeth flashed white against her dusky complexion. She wasn't a dark black girl, more like a coffee with cream color. After the dance, Zebra expressed gratitude, mentioning that Amanda said I wouldn't mind dancing with her. I complimented her dancing skills, but admitted that I did mind, explaining that while I liked her a lot and considered her the sweetest girl I knew, dancing with her was not a good idea for me. She giggled and assured me that I was safe with her, expressing love and acknowledging that if I weren't married, she'd be all over me. However, she emphasized the importance of friendship and suggested we just enjoy that one dance. I squeezed her a little, and we finished the song. When we got back to the booth, Amanda wasn't there. I looked around and spotted her black and white dress. She was on the floor with some young Nordic-looking guy, laughing up into his face, and his hands were lower than they should have been. She noticed me looking for her, smiled, and shot me a wave. I was pissed, very pissed. In fact, she had sent me off with Zebra so she could dance with that idiot. I threw a couple of twenties on the table and started walking toward the exit. Zebra watched me halfway to the door, then came running after me. I stopped, and she, a bit out of breath, asked where I was going. I informed her that we were being played. Amanda had been talking about dating other people and asking me if I ever thought about it. This was a test, and she set me up by getting me to dance with her, giving her an excuse to dance with Romeo inside. She asked what I was doing, and if I was just going to leave Amanda there. I affirmed that I intended to leave her. She grabbed my arm, feeling like a heel, and apologized. I reassured her, saying I didn't like being played any more than she did. She asked me to take her back to my house so she could get her car. As we were almost home, my phone buzzed, but I ignored it. Zebra gave me a look when her phone rang, and she answered it. She told Amanda they were almost at my house, and explained that it wasn't her idea. She rode with us and wasn't about to be stranded. Zebra warned Amanda not to put her in that position, and ended the call. She then informed me that Amanda wanted me to go back and get her. I expressed my desire for a wife who didn't play stupid games, sighing and questioning where this had come from. Zebra explained that it was Marcy from work who had been talking about having an open marriage, claiming it made their bed life better. She and her husband Herb hardly talked and spent their time trying to involve their friends. Amanda fell for it, and Zebra believed she was trying to set us up. I was surprised when Zebra mentioned that Amanda knew she loved me and had always been attracted to me. I nearly choked and apologized for the awkward situation. Zebra expressed that she found me gorgeous, but emphasized being a one-woman kind of guy, not good at sharing toys. She reassured me, questioning why she should be sorry, as she had nothing to do with Amanda's actions. I had the opportunity to dance with my dream man, and I felt no regret about it. I assured her that I would let her know what happened, and she left in her car. Entering the house, I thought for a moment, then gathered my belongings from the master bath and relocated them to the one in the guest room. I also retrieved my work items and placed them there. Locking the door, I went to sleep, possibly aided by the drinks I'd consumed. I was partially awakened by the slamming door downstairs 
and echoing footsteps in the hallway. The doorknob to the bedroom twisted a few times, followed by a tap on the door. I heard Amanda's stage whisper, cautious not to disturb the nearby sleeping girls, asking what was going on. The tapping and whispering persisted for about ten minutes before her footsteps retreated to our bedroom, or what used to be ours. Strangely, I found myself disliking the bed in the guest bedroom. In an attempt to slip away before she woke up, perhaps a coward's plan, I failed. She descended the stairs while I packed files into my briefcase. She sputtered, clearly angry, questioning what was wrong with me. I retorted, suggesting that maybe she should be asking herself that question. Her voice rose as she asked what that was supposed to mean. I picked up my briefcase, stating that everything I did was in reaction to what she did. I expressed not wanting to look at her right now, emphasizing how close she was to making me permanently angry, instructing her to get her act together, ensure all her points were checked off, and be ready to talk about it when I got home, I mentioned that I would pick up the girls and take them to mom's house to settle the matter. Her face went pale, and she claimed to have no idea what I was talking about, suggesting the possibility of having something planned for the night. I told her it was up to her, stating that if she was interested in fixing what's broken, she should be ready and stop with the excuses. I added that if she was fine with the way things were, she could do whatever she wanted, I concluded by telling her to move her belongings into the spare bedroom because I liked my bed, making it clear she wasn't welcome in the same bed as me. She puffed up, but I left her there and went to work. I picked up the girls from school, and they happily went to Graham's for the evening. I informed Mom that Amanda and I were having some problems and needed some time to ourselves. She hugged me and expressed her love. I was grateful not to have to answer a bunch of questions. Amanda was there when I got home. She had made cookies, and a plate of them and a cup of coffee awaited me. Standing up, she clung to me for a moment, kissed my cheek, and sat down beside me on the sofa. I helped myself to a cookie oatmeal with chocolate chips and M and Ms. It seemed like we were off to a good start, and I hated to spoil all this amicability. I addressed Amanda, expressing my disapproval of the unpleasant situation she created the previous night. I emphasized that what she did was not only hurtful to me, but also embarrassing for both of us, and disrespectful to C, who was supposed to be her friend. Amanda had difficulty making eye contact and apologized for her actions. Reflecting on my own behavior, I recognized that I shouldn't have handled the situation that way. My intention had been to open up communication with her, as she had consistently shut me down before. I considered this approach a way for her to contemplate alternative perspectives, in response to my question about possibilities, Amanda hesitated briefly, before blurting out that she had been thinking about trying to date other people. Responding to her revelation, I told her there were several problems with that idea, the first being that both of us happened to be married. She argued that other married people do it, citing open marriages as a way to strengthen love. Skeptical, I questioned her sources, asking for a name. She mentioned Marcy and Herb, claiming they have an open marriage, and that it strengthened their relationship. I doubted the authenticity of her information and suggested looking it up on Google to verify. She seemed a little shocked, but agreed to sit beside me as I fired up my laptop. After typing in, how many people have open marriages, and clicking on the first link, we discovered that according to a survey, less than 1% of Americans have open marriages. Checking several other links yielded the same result, less than 1%. She seemed to have anticipated something different and mentioned that it was still a significant number, estimating at least three million. I disagreed, expressing doubt that many children are married, open or otherwise. Suggesting a different approach, I proposed typing in how many Americans expect their partners to be faithful. After clicking the link, we discovered that more than 95% of Americans expect fidelity. I pondered, so what do you suppose that means? She opined, I guess that most people aren't very open-minded. I thought there'd be more people with alternative lifestyles. I hear about it all the time. I wonder how many of those open marriages end in divorce. Despite her reluctance, I insisted, well, I did, and I wanted her to know. I then typed in, how many open marriages end in divorce? The answer revealed that 92% of open marriages end in divorce in five years or less. I analyzed the statistics, saying, okay, let's see. 
less than 1% of Americans are in an open marriage. That means that out of a million people, fewer than 10,000 are in open marriages. 92% of open marriages end in divorce. That means that out of that 10,000, there are 800 that don't end in divorce in five years. That's 800 out of 1 million. I asked Amanda to do the calculations and consider the odds of success for open marriages, especially when 92% of 1% fail. She admitted that the chances weren't very good. I pointed out that the few successful ones are those where both parties are willing. I directed her to the screen, emphasizing that 100% of marriages where one party is coerced into it fail. I made it clear that our situation would fall into that category since I wasn't willing to participate. I explained how my feelings of resentment, competitiveness, jealousy, insecurity, betrayal, and lack of security would impact us if I were to allow this. I expressed that the only reason I would endure such painful absurdity is if I were desperate to keep her, but I reassured her that I'm not that desperate. I mentioned that other women are attracted to me, citing an encounter from the previous night. I stated that if I were a pathetic loser or a sick individual, I might be interested in playing her game, but I clarified that I'm not that man. I made it clear that I would prefer her to shoot me in the head than break my heart. Amanda weakly responded that she didn't think everything on the internet could be believed. I acknowledged her point, stating that a good bit of it was probably misinformation, especially the part about many people having open marriages, which I suggested she shouldn't believe. I questioned her trust in Marcy, asking if she believed everything Marcy told her and pointing out Marcy's history of multiple divorces. When Amanda didn't know about Marcy's husband, I pressed further, learning that Marcy had been divorced four times. Incredulously, I remarked that Amanda was taking marriage advice from a four-time loser, to which she protested, explaining that Marcy and Herb had a strong marriage. Expressing my disgust with the situation, I asked Amanda about the source of all this information. C revealed that Marcy talked about it all the time, and I also discovered that Marcy and Herb hardly spoke to each other spending their time trying to engage in closeness activities with their friends. Expressing my frustration, I questioned Amanda about her actions, asking her how she thought this situation would end. When she suggested that our bed life had been stale lately, I disagreed, stating that I had been perfectly happy. I further pointed out that her desire to play games had made the situation weird, referencing the last time and how she had climaxed half a dozen times. I questioned if those were Marcy's ideas, and her expression confirmed they were. I reacted strongly, expressing disbelief and frustration, emphasizing our strong marriage and rejecting the idea. She argued that it could be good and exciting, suggesting we share experiences. I responded, calling it a nightmare, and challenging her claim about men's fantasies, suggesting she Google it. I made it clear that any involvement in such matters would mean the end of our relationship. Amanda looked shocked and sought clarification on what we're through meant. She questioned if it meant divorce and expressed disappointment, believing our marriage meant more. I echoed her disappointment, expressing doubt about the strength of our marriage based on her discussion of such matters. I conveyed that her discussion of such matters made me believe our marriage didn't hold much significance for her. I questioned what she would tell our daughters about mom and dad potentially splitting up refuting her notion that it would be because I couldn't accept her having other relationships, I asserted that the truth would be that their mother didn't love their father enough to keep her marriage vows and ensure a loving home for them. I accused her of prioritizing her desires over the well-being of our family. As our anger escalated, she asserted her determination for this to happen, stating it was inevitable. I responded, refusing to accept it and warning of the consequences. I asserted that she was mistaken and emphasized that our marriage wouldn't survive her involvement with someone else, stating that I'd consult a lawyer the moment she went through with it. I presented her with options, forget everything for a quick divorce or schedule therapy sessions to understand her irrational behavior. I expressed my skepticism about the success of counseling, labeling her actions as a major mistake that would make everyone miserable. I attributed her misguided ideas to Marcy's influence and warned that positive outcomes were unlikely. I made it clear that I wouldn't sit idly by, emphasizing the potential suffering for everyone involved. I questioned her about her plans and challenged her actions. She taunted me, 
insisting on her freedom, and claimed I couldn't stop her. She argued I wouldn't divorce her out of fear of losing too much and threatened to take the girls in the house, leaving me with alimony and child support. In response to her taunts, I urged her to think about the situation and not do anything foolish. Despite her claims of love, I resisted her proposal, emphasizing the potential excitement she suggested would only lead to risks and downsides. I stood firm, expressing the gravity of the situation and rejecting her plea to give it a try. She stood up, approached my chair, and tried to embrace and kiss me. I pushed her hands away, stood up and said, Don't touch me. I need to think about this. I'll let you know what I decide. I lied. I didn't need time to contemplate. I needed to organize my strategy. She was probably correct about the complexities of divorcing her. The whole system is messed up. I needed to make some moves. I left her, went to the master bedroom, and locked the door. After spending 30 minutes on the computer and 10 on the phone, I had a financial plan. The problem was the girls. Under Georgia law, where we lived in Atlanta, children over 14 get to choose their custodial parent. I was confident about Audra, my daddy's princess. Olivia loved me, but she also held her mother in high regard. I doubted Audra would go with Amanda, and I hoped Olivia wouldn't want to be separated from her sister. I was betting that if I could make them aware of Amanda's plans and how she intended to use them as leverage for this open marriage, they would want nothing to do with her. It was cynical, and I hated every thought I was having, but I wasn't the one changing the rules. If Amanda had come to me before our marriage, expressing her desire to remain faithful for 19 years and then explore other relationships, would I have married her? Absolutely not. I would have left immediately. She knew it, and she would have done the same. She wanted to change the rules and force me into compliance, resorting to extortion tactics. The conversation unfolded two nights later, with Amanda beginning by offering an apology that I wasn't inclined to accept. I questioned her about the decision to see a therapist and engage in marriage counseling. When she denied having any issues and shifted the blame to me for planning to be with other men, I countered, pointing out the contradiction. She insisted she wasn't planning anything specific, just suggesting we have the option if it came up. In response, I shared a different perspective, revealing that I had opportunities to cheat occasionally throughout the years, but resisted due to a commitment to a plan of loyalty in marriage. I highlighted the importance of planning for a successful marriage and criticized her lack of commitment. I expressed concern about the impact on our promises to each other, our children, and even to God. Despite her hissing response, I questioned how the girls would perceive her betrayal, asserting that she wouldn't be telling them anything. Later that day, Amanda threatened that as the mother, she would undoubtedly get custody of the kids, ensuring I would never see them again. She vowed to make visitations difficult, cautioning me not to say a word to them. After a heated exchange, she glared at me, stormed off, and created enough commotion for anyone on the stairs to hear a couple of faint gasps and a muffled sob. When I reached the stairs, the girls were no longer there. I went to Audra's vacant room and proceeded down the hall to Olivia's room, where I heard hushed voices inside. Upon knocking, Olivia asked what I wanted and I requested to come in. She opened the door and both of them had obviously been crying. Sitting between them, I embraced them both and expressed regret that they had to witness such a conversation. I explained to them my belief that they wouldn't believe me unless they heard the conversation themselves. Olivia reassured me, saying it wasn't my fault, placing the blame on her mother. She mentioned not initially believing me, but now understanding the situation. Audra expressed disbelief at her mother's actions, questioning how she could do such a thing to me and to them. I admitted not knowing the exact motivation, stating that Amanda had been influenced by negative influences at work and had made a firm decision to go through with it. I shared my unsuccessful attempts to dissuade her and mentioned her lack of concern. Concerned about her well-being, Audra asked if Amanda was unwell, to which I responded that I had no clue about her current motivations. I mentioned suggesting therapy and marriage counseling, but Amanda showed no interest. Audra asked what they should do, and I advised them to do nothing for the time being. I explained my plan to wait until Amanda believed I had given up, anticipating her going on a date. At that point, we would be prepared to leave, and I expressed doubts about her willingness to listen, 
even if I attempted to talk her out of it. I asked both of them if they were aligned with my decision, or if they wanted to stay with their mother. Audra exchanged glances with her sister before declaring, No, Dad, we're going with you. My heart lifted, finding solace in the support of my children after nineteen years of disappointment. Over the next two months, Amanda and I barely communicated, assuming roles of distant roommates who harbored little affection for each other. The spare bedroom became her sleeping quarters, while I occupied what had once been our shared space. Despite my efforts to engage her in conversation and dissuade her from her chosen path, our interactions were strained. One evening as we worked together in the garden, I broached the subject. I questioned the success of her plan, asking if our marriage was truly strengthening, where the passionate lovemaking she had envisioned was, and if the situation was as exciting and fulfilling as she had anticipated. She glanced at me, and for the first time, I noticed a hint of doubt in her eyes, quickly replaced by anger. She snapped back, asserting that the situation was a result of my behavior. I expressed my disapproval of my wife planning to engage with others, emphasizing that it wasn't a scenario I welcomed. In response, she insisted that I was the one at fault. During our heated exchange, she practically shouted that I needed to consider the positive aspects of the situation. According to her, everything could be perfect if I let go of my stubborn pride. I questioned the idea of perfection and for whom it would be ideal. From my perspective, the current situation was far from perfect and certainly not favorable for me. I challenged her assertion that she loved me more, emphasizing that my love for her was expressed through granting her freedom while maintaining my commitment. I perceived her desire for exploration and boundary pushing as selfishness rather than an expression of love. I made it clear that my love for her was reflected in my decision not to engage in relationships with others, and if she truly loved me, she would do the same. I questioned Amanda about when she stopped loving me, to which she tearfully denied and claimed her love for me had grown stronger. I challenged her notion of love, suggesting that her actions felt like driving a stake into my heart. In response, she became furious, announcing her plan to go to a club with a colleague, Bill White, on Friday night. She insisted that I join them, promising it would be an exciting experience. Reluctantly, I agreed, stating that since she was going to do it anyway, I might as well go along. As she rushed across the garden, she embraced me tightly, expressing gratitude for my willingness to participate. Despite her assurances, I was already filled with regret, finding the situation unbearable. Contemplating seeking support from C, I decided to give her a call. It became evident that C was furious upon learning about the plan. She expressed her anger, stating that she had no idea she was being set up to be with me when Mandy invited her to go clubbing with Bill White. Upon hearing the slang number, she vowed to confront Mandy. When I requested her help and trust, assuring her that I needed her assistance in this critical moment as I was planning to leave Mandy, C initially expressed her distrust. After calming her down, I explained my plan to pretend to be okay with the situation and asked her to play along by going home with me. She hesitated for a moment before asking what I had in mind. She laughed and questioned the sincerity of my plan, expressing doubt that it might be a devious plot to get her into my house. Amused, I admitted that it indeed was such a plan and clarified that I needed her assistance in moving the girls to my new place while I retrieved our belongings from the house. Surprisingly, she found the vengeful aspect of the plan appealing and agreed to participate. Throughout the week leading up to Friday, Amanda engaged in closeness moments as if there were no tomorrow. On Friday, I emphasized once more, before heading to work, whether she was absolutely certain about the decision and suggested she could still call off the plan. I reminded her of the enjoyable week we had spent together. However, she remained resolute, assuring me that we could discuss it afterward if needed. She expressed gratitude for my willingness to go along with her plan and assured me that the upcoming night would be the best yet. She danced her way out of the bedroom. She knew I was going to love this. Right, I thought sourly. Let's get this day over. When Sebra stopped by the house on Friday evening, she was absolutely stunning. Amanda was cute, petite, and slender, with a cute face that belonged on a teenager. Sebra was in a whole different league. She was tall, and she had one of those bubble butts you hear so much about and almost never see. Amanda was a bit flat back there, 
Zebra wore a short, tight red sheath dress adorned with sequins, looking stunning. I was dressed in a sport coat, black pants, and a ribbed t-shirt under the coat. As she entered, she playfully commented on my attire, suggesting that I was attempting to seduce her. I clarified that it was strictly business that evening, reserving any such intentions for another time. She expressed regret at the missed opportunity, mentioning that she was wearing a thong, believing it would be to my liking. Playfully, I asked her to show me. Drawing her closer, my hands on the hem of her dress, I teasingly lifted it up her legs toward her enticing figure. She warned about Amanda potentially entering at any moment, but I insisted, emphasizing the need for Amanda to think I was participating in her game. We shared a moment of laughter as I continued the playful interaction. As I was about to appreciate the delightful view in front of me, Amanda entered the room unexpectedly. There was a moment of surprise, and Zebra quickly adjusted her dress. Amanda greeted us with a smile, commenting on the apparent early start to our evening. I responded with a playful suggestion that she and Bill should be the ones getting a room. Amanda smirked at us, picked up her clutch, and we headed out for the night. Bill met us at the club. I don't think the evening started the way he'd expected. I shook his hand and just crushed it. I've been powerlifting for years, and one thing it does if you lift without straps is it gives you quite a grip. I could see him start to go weak in the knees, and I let him go. You could tell he wanted to whimper and nurse his hand, but his macho image wouldn't let him. He was one of those pretty boys. Have you ever noticed that, as men approach what some women would call ideal, the likelihood of there being a hairdresser or a Scientologist goes up to near infinity? Observing Bill, I drew a parallel with Tom Cruise. Curious, I inquired if he was a hairdresser, to which he chuckled and dismissed the idea, stating that hairdressers are predominantly gay. Acknowledging this, I brought up L. Ron Hubbard and revealed my affiliation with Scientology for six years, explaining that I was testing a theory. Zebra, having heard my theory before, was on the verge of choking and seemed ready to burst into laughter. Glancing at Amanda, who was visibly red with anger, I realized I might have shared too many private theories with Zebra. Deciding to change the subject, Zebra suggested finding a booth and marched away with a tense posture, with Mr. Bill trailing behind her at a safe distance. Once he was out of earshot, Zebra erupted into laughter, and I joined in, acknowledging, You're a mean man, Corwin. Yeah, well, this is a hell of a night, I responded. Encouraging her to pull herself together and act like she was seducing me, Zebra played her part convincingly. By the time we reached the booth, I found myself thoroughly seduced. After dancing with her twice, she exhibited everything but engaging in an closeness act right on the dance floor. Amanda was occupied with Mr. Bill during our return, and I asked Zebra, Are you ready for the big show? She gazed up at me with those upturned eyes, an expression in them that conveyed this wasn't merely a game for her. They were enormous and radiant brown, and I found myself falling into their depths. I observed those full, lush lips slightly part, and her petite, pointed tongue moistened them. I couldn't resist. I had to taste her. It exceeded all my expectations and more. Suddenly, I heard a noise, and Amanda and Mr. Bill were sliding back into the booth. Oh no, I exclaimed in my best Saturday Night Live voice impression. Look who's back! Zebra caught on, and so did Amanda, but Mr. Bill remained oblivious. Zebra chuckled, advising against doing anything mean to him. Amanda's face changed, puffing up like a pufferfish, and the smug smirk disappeared. I informed them that Zebra and I were planning to leave. I suggested they have fun, and Amanda escorted us to the door. She inquired about my well-being, noting that I had been acting like an idiot earlier. I responded that I was not okay and urged Mandy to consider leaving now with me. I proposed going home and trying to work things out. I warned that if she stayed, it would be a permanent decision. She expressed her excitement, mentioning that this would be great for us and advised me to go and enjoy myself assuring it would be awesome. She encouraged me to avoid being an idiot. I retorted, implying her interest in Mr. Bill, not me, and stated that we were leaving. She grabbed my arm, insisting it would be a great experience, emphasizing that Zebra was interested in me. I questioned if she was spending the night with him, teasing about his stamina. She hesitated a bit, mentioning she might get home around midnight, planning to spice things up with Mr. Bill. I slapped myself on the forehead, remembering their plans. 
I told her to be quiet if Sebra and I were still engaged when she returned. She kissed me, and I hoped she enjoyed it, knowing it would be the last one. I left and got into the car, where Sebra was waiting. She asked if I was sure about my decision, considering my long marriage. I sighed and affirmed that I was sure. She commented on my seemingly calm demeanor, expressing surprise at my lack of distress. I explained that I had run out of emotional energy, having been upset for an extended period. I clarified that I was now just tired and sick, wanting the ordeal to be over. I mentioned that I had shed countless tears, but that time had passed, and it was now time to move on. I suggested going to get the girls. Upon arriving, we noticed the moving truck already being loaded. The girls were busy carrying their clothes downstairs and packing them in large plastic tubs. As for furniture, we were only taking essential items, such as the bed from the master suite, the girls' beds, their TVs and electronics, and the big screen we had replaced six months ago with an even larger one. When the girls completed their packing, C took them in her car, and they drove to our new place. It was as far from the old one as we could get while still remaining in the same school district. The guys finished packing, and I took a final look around. It appeared empty and silent, with only the ghosts of nineteen years lingering. With a sigh, I removed my wedding ring and placed it on the kitchen table alongside my cell phone. The girls' phones were already there, signaling it was time to leave. A sense of melancholy surrounded me. I was departing with a whimper, a few petty jabs at Amanda and Mr. Bill, and I was walking away from nineteen years that had been pretty damn good. Oh well, stuff happens. I locked up, loaded my tools from the garage into the back of my truck, and departed. The girls were quite excited about the new place, especially with its backyard pool. They couldn't wait to try it out the next day. Do you like that baby? I asked Audra. She yeeted, she said. I had no idea what yeet meant but it sounded positive. Zebra was present, still looking amazing. However, even if she had been Jennifer Lawrence in the flesh, I was just tired. Not that I'd prefer Jennifer Lawrence to Sebra, but you know what I mean. I think she sensed that and gave me a dazzling smile, a quick peck on the cheek, and then she was gone. The lingering scent of her perfume was the only reminder that she had been there. We went to bed, and surprisingly I slept not well, but I did sleep. The next morning, I got up and made coffee, and the girls joined me after a while. We had a Danish Kringle and chocolate milk for breakfast and they watched cartoons on TV until noon. Two gorgeous little bikini-clad bundles of energy were then splashing in the pool while I lounged and observed. I wasn't really paying attention, wondering what Mandy was doing. By now, she'd likely be frantic, calling everyone she could think of, trying to figure out what had happened. She was going to have a tough time finding us. I wasn't working, I had sold the business and made out well. The girls weren't in school, it was summer vacation. We weren't going anywhere except to the grocery store, and we walked or took a bus there. The truck was parked in the garage. I was sure she had the police looking for us, but not having a car would be problematic for them. The only way she could reach us was electronically. She flooded our inboxes with messages, immediately messaged the girls whenever they signed onto social media, and sent tweets and messages on Instagram. We read them, but didn't respond. Let her find us the hard way. I anticipated that she would eventually look for me, considering she had work and bills to pay. I, on the other hand, wasn't making any payments, and I knew she would quickly fall behind. We had significant equity in the house, and losing it wouldn't be something she'd desire. About three weeks later, a private detective approached me in the grocery store. He inquired about my identity, to which I responded that my wife had hired him to find me. He declared his intention to inform her of my whereabouts and suggested I give her a call. Threateningly, he warned of charging me with stalking if he saw me around. Dismissing him, I told him to smack it, expressing no intention of reaching out to her. It turned out I didn't have to. The police showed up, and Mandy had fed them a line that I had kidnapped the girls. They requested me to go down to the station and sort it out. When I declined, they arrested me and took me downtown. The girls went in another car, and upon reaching the station, Amanda was there. She attempted to hug the girls, but they rejected her. They pushed her away, and a woman came to get them, along with Amanda. They went into one room, and I into another. The cops began questioning me aggressively. I provided my identification, 
noting that they already had my driver's license. The only words I uttered were a declaration of my intention to remain silent and my request to speak to an attorney. This statement silenced them, and I overheard one of them mentioning that I was lawyering up. They handed me a phone, and I called John Trimble, who arrived in 45 minutes as we had planned. It took approximately three hours to resolve everything. During the process, the girls affirmed that they were with me willingly and denied any kidnapping. They refused to speak to their mother. John took over from there, pointing out the absence of a court order on custody. He emphasized that under Georgia law, both parents were considered equal candidates for custody and highlighted that children over 14 could choose the parent with whom they wanted to live. Ultimately, they had no choice but to let us go. Zebra walked out with us, and Amanda trailed behind, pleading with the girls to talk to her. They got in Zebra's car and drove away, leaving us alone in the parking lot. Amanda was crying buckets, appearing like a mess. She turned those forlorn eyes toward me and fell to her knees. I reminded her that I had previously begged her not to mess around with Mr. Bill, stating that she hadn't listened, so why should I? She continued pleading, asking me not to treat her this way and expressing sorrow. I agreed to talk, asking her where she wanted to go. She pleaded to go home, not wanting anyone to see her like this. I suggested going to my home, as I had no interest in going to hers and didn't know who she had been involved with there. She gave a little wail of dismay but nodded her head, agreeing to go to my home. She said, Okay, Corwin, whatever you want, but it's your home too. I didn't argue with her. She suggested that I ride with her, but I declined, opting to call a cab instead. She followed me home. Knowing the girls were with Zebra and spending the night, I welcomed Amanda in and got her a cup of coffee. We sat at the bar, and an uncomfortable silence lingered. Silence hadn't been uncomfortable between us since our third date, but it sure was now. After a while she asked what I wanted, and I countered by asking if I had mentioned wanting anything. She clarified, asking what she needed to do to get me to come home and see the girls. I responded that I had no control over her seeing the girls. It was their choice. She accused me of poisoning the girls against her and suggested Marcy might have told me about it. I inquired if Marcy was the oracle of all wisdom. She repeated her question, asking what I wanted. I noted that the funny thing was, I hadn't said a word to the girls about her. The only thing I had told them was that I was leaving and they needed to decide who they wanted to live with. When she pressed on, wondering who had told them, I revealed that she was the one who had told them. Confused, she asked when she would have said anything. I reminded her of the night in the living room when she threatened me, and I pointed out that the girls were sitting on the stairs, overhearing every word she said. Her face went pale, and she started sobbing, unable to continue. I conveyed to her that the girls believed she had poisoned their perception, and I added that I also shared that belief. Her pleading was pitiful, reminiscent of my own. I responded callously, expressing indifference towards the situation with the girls, stating that she had messed it up and needed to fix it. When she asked what could be done with me, I suggested she file for divorce. She insisted that she didn't want a divorce. She just wanted me to come home. I asserted that I considered myself already at home, clarifying that I didn't live with her. She apologized, admitting it was a mistake to force me into the situation and expressing regret. She pleaded for forgiveness, proposing to go to a marriage counselor or a therapist. In response, I explained that the problem wasn't that I didn't want it, but that she did. I demanded that she file for divorce and warned her that if she didn't do so within a few months, I would take the initiative. I made it clear that I wanted nothing to do with her, considering our relationship irreparable. Angry, she called me a fool, accusing me of taking all our money by selling the business and emptying our bank accounts. I defended my actions, stating that I had sold the business at a significant loss and had taken only the money I had earned. I emphasized that I didn't have a dime of it left. All of that was indeed accurate. I had securely stashed the money away in an offshore account, realizing it was crucial to do so before the divorce proceedings began. The records indicated that I sold the business to a Danish company for an amount less than what I owed in taxes. I had intentionally overpaid the IRS significantly, with the surplus funds held to offset future tax liabilities. Our brokerage accounts remained untouched, 
although I recognized that I would have to relinquish half of them. To secure the girls' financial future, I had initiated a trust for them, ensuring they would be financially comfortable for the next three months. As part of my strategy, I had been frequenting various grocery stores, Walmarts, and convenience stores in town. Using my debit card, I made a point to request cash back every time the machine prompted me to do so. I had been obtaining cash, ranging between $1.60 and $1.80, from numerous stores in town with three people involved in each transaction. This strategy had the potential to accumulate a significant amount quickly. The transactions were legitimate, and I had a substantial stack of cash stored in an old chest in a storage building, ready for use once the coast was clear. Addressing Amanda, I informed her that she could have the house. The equity built up in it was sufficient for her to sell, get out of the mortgage, and manage for a while. I suggested that after selling the house, she might consider moving in with Mr. Bill, wondering aloud about his wife's reaction to that prospect. Amanda gasped, claiming ignorance of his marital status. I pointed out that her desire for an open marriage indicated a lack of concern about his marital status and advised her to move on, urging her to file for divorce. Standing up and heading towards the door, I was followed by Amanda, who was visibly upset, wringing her hands and crying. She stopped at the door, looked up at me, and requested that I tell the girls that she loved them, and apologized. I agreed to convey the message, and asserted that I wasn't giving up. I clarified that I wasn't filing for divorce because I didn't want one, expressing my desire for her to come back home. She commented on my apparent lack of open-mindedness and expressed regret that she hadn't anticipated the situation turning out this way. She continued professing her love for me and declared her intention to keep trying. I was too tired to argue with her. I saw her out the door, took a minute to collect myself, and called Zebra. She brought the girls home, but she didn't come in. Audra and Olivia were very upset and even angrier with their mother than before, if that was possible. I knew they wouldn't be at all receptive to the message from Amanda I had for them, so I decided to just sit on it for a while. Two days later, Amanda showed up about 4.30 with dinner. She'd made a chicken tetrazzini with French-cut green beans and a big basket of garlic bread. Olivia opened the door. Amanda tried to hug her and got a stiff arm for her troubles. Amanda greeted me, addressing me as, Baby, and Olivia called out for my attention. I heard Amanda expressing her apologies professing love, and stating that she missed me. However, Olivia abruptly shut her down, refusing to hear any of it and instructing her to stay away. Amanda was visibly shaken, and as she nearly collapsed, I rescued the basket of food she was carrying. Taking her to the sofa, she sat down and buried her face in her hands, sobbing about how much she was hated. I acknowledged that what she did to the girls was hurtful and expressed doubt that they would trust her again. Despite sympathizing with her pain, I emphasized that rebuilding any relationship with the girls would be her responsibility, not theirs or mine. She mentioned making dinner and looked at me pleadingly. Despite recognizing that she brought it upon herself, I decided to help. I offered to talk to the girls while she found the dishes in the kitchen. Upstairs, the girls were furious, expressing disbelief at Amanda showing up and thinking that feeding them would make everything okay. Audra voiced her anger stating that Amanda had destroyed their family. I empathized with Audra, explaining that Amanda had thrown in the hand grenade and now had to deal with the consequences. Despite Amanda's misguided perception that I was the problem, I reassured the girls that my love for them remained unchanged. I gave them the option to stay with me or be with their mother, emphasizing that my love for them would never waver. Olivia expressed her strong aversion to eating with her mother stating that she'd rather hang herself. The girls affirmed their decision to stay with me, and we shared a hug. I proposed the idea of going down to eat with their mother and trying to be civil. Olivia asked if I wanted them to, and I expressed my desire for them to do so while avoiding mean comments. They agreed to be civil, but intended to convey their feelings. The dinner turned out to be extremely awkward. Amanda tried to engage the girls in conversation, but they responded with curt replies. After the meal, we cleaned up, packed Amanda's dishes, and she prepared to leave. When Amanda asked Audra for a hug, Audra declined, stating that Amanda was no longer her mother. Both girls went to their rooms without saying another word. Amanda was visibly distraught, 
and it took her about thirty minutes to compose herself enough to leave. Despite feeling pity for her, I took no responsibility for the situation. I found satisfaction in the turn of events, enjoying every minute of it. She continued to come over about once a week, and the girls kept destroying her hopes. She didn't file for divorce and continued to try to talk me into moving back in with her. After six months, I filed. When the divorce was final, I think Amanda finally realized that we were through. The court gave her visitation rights, and somehow every time she wanted to visit, there was something that did not let the visit happen. I certainly hoped she found someone that suited her open life. I sure had. I am still unmarried, my life dedicated only for my girls.